All right, thank you. Uh, just a couple, uh, one, uh, actually just one uh, administrative and personnel related thing to say at the top. Uh, the Secretary has appointed Mr. Peter Levine and Ms. Lisa Disbro to serve on the Commission on Planning, Programming, Budgeting, and Execution Reform. Mr. Levine previously served as DOD Deputy Chief Management Officer and Acting Under Secretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness. That following his 20 years of service as Minority Counsel, General Counsel, and Staff Director of the Senate Armed Services Committee. And he is ser currently serving as a Senior Fellow at the Institute for Defense Analyses. Ms. Dispro, uh, who I think many of you know, previously served as Under Secretary of the Air Force, and prior to that, Assist, Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Financial Management and the Comptroller. She was also the Vice Director of the Joint Staff J-8. She currently serves as a Director on the Board of Mercury Systems. The whole leadership uh, team here looks forward to working with Mr. Levine and Ms. Disbro in their new roles as members of the Commission. Uh, we're grateful for their willingness to continue to serve the country in this capacity and uh, certainly look forward to, uh, to the work, the good work that the Commission will help us do in, in, in terms of our own programming and uh, budgeting and execution. Uh, so with that, we'll go to questions. Lita. Uh, thanks, John. Um, two things. One, um, one of the things that the Russians said today um, was that they boosted their staff at some of their nuclear sites. I'm wondering if there's anything that the Pentagon has seen regarding any changes in their nuclear posture at all. And then secondly, um, can you provide any assessment on the convoy that's headed to Kyiv and what the security situation in Kyiv is to the best uh, that you all can tell right now? Yeah. Um, so on the nuclear question, I. Uh, I have nothing to confirm these reports that they've changed their staffing. Um, what I would tell you is we've seen Mr. Putin's announcement. Um, uh, we believe it's as unnecessary as it is escalatory, but uh, we're reviewing and analyzing that uh, that announcement. Um, and I would only just tell you that um, that as we continue to review and and, and analyze and monitor, uh, the, the Secretary Austin is is comfortable with the, the strategic deterrent posture of the United States and our ability to defend the homeland, our allies, and our, and our partners. On the, the, the convoy, I mean, I've seen the images that, that uh, you're referring to um, uh, on, on television, just like you. I mean, we, we, we see them as well. Um, I can't speak to specifics about its makeup uh, uh, in, in the timeline and the schedule that they're on or, or what their ultimate uh, destination is. But clearly, we continue to see Russian forces uh, uh, move on or move, try to move closer to so they can move on Kyiv from the ground. Um, uh, we still assess that they're uh, outside the city center. Um, and uh, but uh, what we know uh, clearly that uh, they have they have uh, intentions with respect to Kyiv. Um, what we also have seen is Ukrainians uh, resisting quite effectively um, around Kyiv um, and continuously. Uh, they, they have made it uh, a tough slog for the Russians uh, to move f further south. Um, and as uh, I think you've seen uh, in reporting of your own, that uh, the Russians have not only experienced a stiff and determined resistance by the Ukrainians, uh, but logistics and sustainment problems of their own. So I can't speak with specificity about this convoy and, and what's in it and, and what their and what their designs are, but it, it clearly appears to us just anecdotally as of a piece of their desire to continue to move on uh, on the capital. Jen, John, what's your assessment of the Russian military? What have you learned about the Russian military from this last uh, five days? You know, I think it's uh, it's too soon for us to have some sort of sweeping conclusions about the Russian military here in day five. Um, I would doesn't look very modern. I, I would uh, I would uh, just say a couple of things. Um, uh, first of all, um, make no mistake, Mr. Putin still has at his disposal significant combat power. He hasn't moved all of it into Ukraine, but he's moved the majority of it. He still has a lot that he hasn't moved into Ukraine. Um, it's combined arms. 
Um, and it's not insignificant, Jen. Um, number two, yes, they have faced setbacks uh, and, uh, uh, and they have faced resistance. Uh, you got you, you to gotta hand it to the Ukrainians, who have been fighting very hard for their country and making an impact and making a dent on Mr. Putin's abilities. Uh, but uh, they will learn. The Russians will learn from this. Uh, we expect that they'll—that uh, 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 that they're— we haven't seen any, uh, any change in, in, in what we believe their desires to move in Ukraine. Um, and so— uh, they have suffered setbacks, but I don't think we can just assume that they're going to stay set back, if you will, uh, that they will uh, that they will try to to work through these uh, the resistance and to work through the challenges they've had on the logistics and sustainment front. Uh, go ahead. Have you seen any new threat to Article five nations from Russian forces? We have not. We have not. Tara. Hi, John. Um, Russia has said it will now hold accountable any nation that supplies weapons to Ukraine that lead to the death of its own forces. Is there a risk here that this could escalate if Russia decides to retaliate against nations that are providing these uh, weapons? Tar, th there's been a risk of escalation since uh, since before Mr. Putin decided to move in you know, with tens of thousands of troops and tanks and mechanized forces and aircraft and, uh, and ballistic missiles. Um, you want to talk about escalation? Let's talk about escalation. Mr. Putin is the one escalating this and continues to do so. Uh, we're going to stand by our, the Ukrainian armed forces as we have, as other NATO allies have, and we're going to continue to find ways to help them defend themselves. Uh, John, also Turkey today uh, announced that they are closing the straits to the oil warships for the littoral and non littoral countries. Do you have anything on that? Do you have any comment? I haven't. Uh, I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't have anything on that. Yeah, Abraham. Thanks, John. Um, is DOD coordinating air defense assistance with partners, and can you comment on the EU offer to give Ukraine combat jets? I can't comment on the EU offer. We've seen that. I mean, that's really for the European Union to speak to. Uh, but uh, separate and distinct from that, and I think this gets really more at your first question, uh, we absolutely remain in close consultation and coordination with allies and partners about security assistance. Um, and uh, I, I don't have a coordination mechanism to speak to, like all of it's being funneled through a single point or that kind of thing. Uh, but we continue to coordinate uh, closely with allies and partners about the security assistance that the Ukrainians continue to get, not just from us, but from, from them as well. Yeah. Yeah. So um, many European nations are providing Ukrainians with uh, advanced uh, uh, weapons. They're not, they're not shy in revealing what types of weapons they're, they're providing uh, to Ukraine. In the past, the U.S. has been reluctant in providing lethal weapon, but now, you know, openly we're talking about these things. However, you know, we're still talking anti-airborne, anti-armored, uh, but there's no specificity. Is this because of intelligence reasons or, uh, as some might say, you don't want to provoke the Russians more? Um, I mean, what is the reason that it's open? The U.S. will support the Ukrainian forces. We're going to continue to do that, as, as you said, and other officials. But what on the specific uh, side of these weapons? Fadi, I... I um don't think we've been inconsistent at all. Uh, I can't speak for what other nations are saying and doing. They can speak for the security assistance they're providing the Ukrainians, which is welcome uh, and, and, and certainly encouraged. Uh, we've been pretty consistent about, A, acknowledging we're, we're doing it and going to continue to do it, B, uh, giving you a sense of the size and scale and the scope of it in terms of the dollar figures applied to it. Um, and, and C, been pretty, I think, transparent about what's generally in the package. Uh, we're not going to give you an inventory list. We're not going to put that out to the public because, as I've said from this podium many times before, we don't think there's a value to operational security for the Ukrainians to, to have that out in the public, that, uh, what the shopping list looks like on any given day. Uh, just don't see a value to doing that. Um, uh, I, think, I think we need to think about, we should always think about operational security, certainly in this case for, on the Ukrainians' part. So we're doing that. Um, the, the kinds of uh, material that uh, are going to be in these uh, security assistance packages going forward. I think you've rightly said, we've detailed, it's going to be uh, some uh, uh, weapons that can support them on the ground as well as weapons that can support uh, the airborne challenges that they have. And I think, uh, I think we feel comfortable going about that far. 
And, and on the, uh, the, the images coming from Maxar, the satellite images of this convoy that extends for 17 miles, um, do you believe the, the, the Russians, uh, Russian forces advancing on Kiev are planning on basically encircle the, the city or storm Kiev? I mean, this type of, um, this type of troops and armaments at, at this size, are, are you able to draw any uh, conclusion from what you've seen? I think the main conclusion that we can draw, this gets to Lita's question, is that, we, that, that they continue to, to want to move on Kiev, to capture Kiev, to take Kiev. Um, and uh, although we don't know everything about this convoy, it is certainly in keeping with what we believe to be their intent with, with respect to the capital city. How they're going to do that, uh, whether it's encirclement or, uh, or, or bombardment or, or street to street fighting, I mean, I just don't think we have that level of dexterity now to give you that kind of detail in terms of Russian planning. We don't, we don't have insights to everything that they're planning on doing. Um, what we can Talk, talk about is what we're seeing now, and, and that's what we're seeing now. And we're also seeing the Ukrainians put up a very stiff and determined resistance on their capital city. I and mean, they have made it very difficult for the Russians to, to continue to move ahead. We believe that the, uh, based on what we know of what their plans were, that they are behind schedule, that they have faced a stiffer resistance than they anticipated. Thank you. Court. Can you update us on, on any efforts at deconfliction? And have there been any, like, close calls or specific cases in the last five days where there would be a need for a tactical deconfliction? And then, like, how is, are, are there calls that are being made from this building, from the White House, from the State Department, whatever it is, to try to establish that? I would say that um, uh, there is no deconfliction mechanism uh, in place right now. Uh, but, uh, but certainly we understand the importance of deconfliction, particularly now that the airspace over Ukraine is contested, and some of that airspace butts right up against NATO territory. Um, and we're exploring options for, uh, should there be a deconfliction mechanism, what would that look like? How would that be run? We're exploring those options, Court. I think that's, that's where we are right when, now. When you say we, you mean the Pentagon? The is? Pentagon, yes. Is there, con is there a consideration of sort of like a, a larger NATO deconfliction? So like somehow NATO would be the one who would be com communicating? Sure. That, that could be part of the calculus. Again, we're kind of exploring the options right now. We don't have, uh, we don't have concrete decisions, and we don't have any indication right now from the Russians that they would also be interested in exploring those options. Uh, it's got to be a two-way street. But we are having discussions here about uh, what that should look like, could look like, and certainly one option could be that it's done at, uh, you know, inside the alliance rather than a unilateral thing. So at this point, this is Russia has shown no no interest in establishing this deal. I think that's a, a safe bet. Yes, ma'am. Carla. Thank you. Is you know, now that we've seen civilian targets that have been hit, is the U.S. considering installing a no-fly zone in Ukrainian airspace? No. And then to follow, can you tell us if there's been any more requests from NATO allies for U.S. military assistance and give us an update on the troops that have deployed for this potential inclusion in the NATO response force? What are they doing right now? Uh, there's no additional requests for allied support that I'm, that I'm tracking, uh, Carla, but obviously this is a dynamic situation. We're in constant touch with our allies and partners, and we'll certainly continue to talk about that. I would not rule out in coming days additional repositioning in Europe as appropriate. Um, uh, I, I don't have any updates for, for you on, uh, on the NATO response force or, uh, or, or the troops that we have uh, contributed. The president spoke to the 7,000 that were going over there. They could be elements of our contribution to the very uh, ready joint task force uh, that, uh, that uh, NATO um, is working on, on putting together. But, uh, but you do really have to talk to, 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 uh, to NATO and the alliance there in Brussels about their plans for that. What I would just tell you is that Secretary Austin has been very clear from the very beginning that uh, should it be activated, we want to make sure we're ready. And that's why uh, we, we've sent some additional forces to Europe to be in that p posture and to be ready. Uh, should, uh, should that be the, the requirement that comes from the alliance? Again, we haven't gotten s specific requirements laid out yet for, for us. Um, and as for the troops that we have already repositioned and or deployed from the states unilaterally, um, uh, they continue to work and train. 
um, uh, with uh, with the, the host nations as well as other uh, NATO allies uh, in wh wherever they are, whether it's in the Baltic region uh, or whether it's uh, down in the southeastern flank, uh, Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania. They continue to, to work and train with the, with their host nations and allied partners. And then the 82nd, as you know, in Poland, uh, they are also there as a, a reassurance force, uh, but they are postured and prepared to assist if needed with any evacuation uh, assistance for Americans coming across that border. Uh, there's been, there hasn't been a, a heavy demand for that. They're postured and ready to do that, but there just hasn't been a, a large outflow of American citizens from Ukraine. And those that have come by and large by a vast majority have not needed any assistance from the United States military. They've already made their plans. They know where they're going. Uh, there's obviously good transportation uh, available to them in Poland. Okay. Let me get uh, to the phones here. Uh, Tony Capaccio. Hi, John. Quick question. How, by how many days do you think the Russians have been derailed or been delayed from their original plans? You've alluded to that. You, you referenced that today, that they're behind what you think was their schedule. Were they intending to be in Kiev by today and have conquered the city under their original war plan? Tony, I... I, I Want to be reticent here to, to get too much into Russian planning. I mean, I, I think they, uh, they're they far better to speak to what their plans were. Uh, we think that they're uh, a few days behind where they expected to be writ large in the country. I mean, I know we're focused on Kiev now, but uh, we think they're, you know, they're, they're a few days behind what, where they expected to be at this point. Phil Stort. That we've provided to the Ukrainians. Can you broadly say well, how effective they've, they've been used and how widely they've been used? You know, we're talking javelins and other ones that have been in the news. I'm going to steer away from getting into a, a battlefield analysis of the weaponry that's being used on any given day and to what effect. Uh, we know that the Ukrainian armed forces are using uh, a lot of the, the systems and equipment. Uh, that have been provided to them, not just by the United States, but by other nations. And as I said, and you can see it for yourself, uh, and many of your outlets, you, you've got reporters on the ground who are seeing it up close and personal, the Ukrainians have been effective at, at using these weapons and these systems um, and, about, and, and at uh, resisting and, uh, and pushing back uh, Russian forces. I want to remind again that this is a, uh, you know, it, it, this is a dynamic situation. It's war, uh, and war can be unpredictable. And, uh, and I and uh, I don't think that um, that anybody, including perhaps especially Ukrainians, are sniffing at uh, uh, at Russian capabilities that they're facing. Uh, Phil Stort. John, um, what would the U.S. or NATO allies do if Russia were to target these convoys or these shipments of these weapons that are going to Ukraine, especially now that? Russia has warned uh, that they find these shipments unacceptable. Yeah, I'm not going to get into a, a hypothetical, Phil. Uh, we're going to continue to provide security assistance uh, to, to Ukrainian armed forces, uh, and uh, we're still going to look for ways uh, to, to do that in the most effective, efficient way possible. Uh, our support for, uh, for Ukraine uh, continues, as well as that of uh, allies and partners. And I'm, I'm going to refrain from hypothesizing about uh, what ifs uh, in, in terms of uh, any disruptions or potential disruptions uh, to that assistance. Mike Glenn. Yeah, hi, John. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, question. The, uh, the Russians have violated basically every maximum of, rule, of war you can think of. I mean, under the three to one rule ratio, ratio rule, they should have fielded about a million troops instead of the 200,000 or so they fielded. Uh, they're not concentrating forces. They don't have, uh, you know, uh, control of the airspace. They didn't, they don't, they don't have, they didn't have a, a good situational awareness of their opponent. My question is, are leadership in the building, are they surprised about just how bad the Russians have done, have bungled this invasion so far? We're watching this as uh, closely as you guys are on a day by day basis. Um, and, um, and we're, we're, we're refraining from uh, making some sort of broad uh, assessments or assigning report cards to them on, on any given day. Um, it is day five, Mike. This is day five. And it's clear the Russians have not made the progress that they wanted to make by day five. Uh, but that doesn't mean 
uh, that they aren't going to adapt and, and try to overcome some of these challenges. Um, and it doesn't mean that the, the, that the U Ukrainians uh, aren't going to also keep fighting for their country. Uh, and what that looks like tomorrow and the next day, you know, we just don't know. Um, so uh, it's clear, yes, the Russians um, uh, have, uh, have had their own challenges, and they have met resistance that we don't believe they fully expected. Uh, but uh, I think it'd be dangerous territory for us to, to read uh, too much into this on any given day and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and prognosticate about where it's going to go. Uh, I would also just add that the one place it still could go is a peaceful diplomatic outcome. Uh, uh, th there's nothing uh, other than uh, perhaps his own obstinance of pre preventing Mr. Putin from, from doing the right thing here and to trying to find a, a, a way to, to stop this war, to de-escalate the tensions, um, and to, uh, to re-engage uh, uh, in some sort of a diplomatic, peaceful path forward. Uh, now, we'll see if, if that can bear out. It clearly doesn't appear to be the path he wants to, to choose. Louis. Um, can I ask you two questions? One, there have been reports that um, the Russians have used cluster munitions in Kharkiv. Um, do you have anything that would suggest that? And um, how would you view that if that was the case? And then I've seen the imagery uh, that you guys have seen that's sort of leading to these questions, Louis. We can't independently verify that. But uh, look, the, um, Let's not get hung up on a particular weapon system here. He's perpetrating violence on a neighboring nation state that presented no threat to him. Uh, and innocent lives are being killed, uh, taken. Uh, and, and we've seen casualties. We know there's casualties on both sides of this conflict. All of this, Louis, was avoidable. So um, uh, the obviously certain weapons carry with them uh, ramifications that others don't. But let's not get too wrapped up in whether it's this or that. This is a war of choice, completely and totally unavoidable. And all the casualties are on his hands. All the blood is on Mr. Putin's hands. Follow up on a different matter. You, you spoke earlier about the thousands of soldiers from the 82nd who were yeah. there. To help with the situation that has not emerged, you know, helping Americans get out. There's a broader situation that's taking place on that border. You now have almost 300,000 people who have crossed over the border in the last yeah. four days. Is there any discussion that those forces may be committed to a broader humanitarian mission um, and, and under whatever uh, authority uh, to, to ease that situation, given the limited resourcing that Poland may have? We're in constant touch with uh, our State Department colleagues uh, and with Polish authorities. Um, and uh, if there's such a demand signal uh, outside of Ukraine, if there's such a demand signal, obviously the Department of Defense would would uh, would do our part and and help out. There's no such demand signal right now. Uh, Jeff Shogel. Thank you. I, I just wanted to clarify when you answered Tony's questions. I think you said something along the lines of. No one is sniffing at these weapons. Was sniffing the right word? I think it was. Uh, let's see. Uh, Heather from USNI. Great, thank you. I was wondering if you can give us an update on any naval move, uh, movements you may have seen on um, this afternoon, as well as any update on whether Turkey is planning to close off the Bosphorus to um, ships outside the Black, fleet, Black Sea Fleet. Turkey. I'll let Turkey speak to their application of the Montreux Convention. That's uh, that. That's for them to speak to. Um, in the maritime domain, um, uh, we know that, uh, that the Russians still have. They still have uh, a. a uh, they still have warships as well, which includes uh, amphibious landing ships uh, in the Black Sea. Uh, we know that they used some of those uh, landing ships uh, to conduct an amphibious assault uh, late last week. Uh, I, I don't have any updates uh, or specific things to speak about uh, in the maritime uh, domain in the Black Sea, but we do know that they, they clearly still have combat capability at sea available to them, um, and I just don't have anything more uh, in terms of what we're seeing, anything, anything more uh, kinetic to talk to. Have you seen any evidence 
evidence that the Snake Island sailors are alive? The Ukrainians, there was no. I mean, we've seen some press reporting to that effect, Jen, but I you have no way to, I, I, no way to verify that one way or the other. Sorry, yeah, Orm. The, the assistance, security assistance, both lethal and non lethal, that the U.S. and others are sending in, do you have indications that that's getting where it needs to go? Are those lines working? And then how far into the country can they get? Kiev, Kharkiv? Uh, I would just tell you, Orrin, that. Uh, that the, the assistance continues to flow, and we are comfortable that it's, it's, it's getting into the hands that, that need it. I think I'd leave it there. Abraham, I already got you. You're going twice. No, no, I'm not. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Okay. I wonder if you I'll could give talk you one about, more. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I wonder if you could uh, address sort of the air policing mission. The United States has F-16s, F-35s moving fifth-gen capabilities to the eastern flank, all the way from the Baltics down to and the Black Sea. And F-18s. Can you talk a little bit about the deterrent uh, effect that, that has had and what they're doing exactly? The Baltic air police m mission, I think you know, uh, is uh, longstanding. It's something we've been doing for uh, uh, quite a while, um, and it remains a, a valid mission set for uh, our pilots and aircraft that are based there at UCOM. As I said, some of them uh, uh, are coming uh, from the, the Navy side uh, as well. And, um, and we're going to continue to work with the, with the Baltic states on this air pollution. But those, but those missions are happening. I mean, they are, they're happening in real time, and they, and they have, even before this crisis. Um, and it's important, uh, especially, you know, back to, um, to, to some degree, uh, back to Court's question about deconfliction. I mean, this is airspace that now butts up against what is now contested airspace. So, uh, in many ways, these air policing missions are, are uh, more important than ever before. Tara. Just one more, since you're feeling generous. Um, <laughs> do you, has the Pentagon been able to assess anything additional from um, Putin's orders putting troops on the heightened nuclear deterrent posture? I, I, I kind of already dealt with that with, uh, with Lita. I think I'll just leave my answer like I left it with her. Okay, you're it. <laughs> Thank you, Madam. <laughs> so, we know that Russians are using cruise missiles, ballistic missiles. In, in advanced um, air technologies, is the un, um, you know NATO airspace being protected by advanced air defense systems right now? Are you ready to intercept any uh, Russian missiles crossing into the airspace? Yeah, I, I won't talk about the specifics of uh, how NATO airspace uh, is or will be protected. Um, uh, I would just tell you that. Uh, uh, one of the reasons why we have, and you've seen some of the air assets we've contributed now uh, in just the last week or so, uh, is to make sure that we, uh, when we say we're going to defend every inch of NATO territory, that means from the sky as well, we are working uh, in, in close coordination with our allies and partners and their air forces uh, to make sure that we can meet that need. Okay, thanks everybody. Appreciate it.